We have a very practical piece of scripture that we're going to study together at this time. And many times we need scripture that tells us not only biblical truth, but how to implement that truth into our life in order that what God wants becomes a reality. So ask yourself a very important question. Do I want God's purposes for my life? Am I committed to his will? If you are, then if you do these things that Paul's going to reveal to us, you are going to find yourself truly being transformed, being a recipient of God's power, God's provision, God's perspective, in order that you can do his will and manifest unto him glory. And that is exactly why not only you were created, but why he sent his son into this world, that you might represent to others the glory of God, that your life might be an influence upon them for they too to experience the will of God. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Romans and chapter 12. The book of Romans and chapter 12. We're going to begin in verse 14. And again, Paul has for us some very practical instruction. First of all, it's not hard to understand these things, but if we implement them in our life, we apply them to our daily situation you are going to be literally amazed on how God is going to come alive in your life and how his presence is going to be experienced in the various situations that you find yourself encountering. So look with me to that first verse, verse 14. He says, bless those who persecute you. Now, that is an entirely different way of thinking than than the natural man for those who are in the natural and not walking in the spirit if someone is is persecuting them that person is going to to respond in a similar way they are going to be angry they are going to want to defend themselves and they are going to want to place upon that individual that same type of of pain, suffering, discomfort, whatever it might be. And we see that even with small children and sometimes adults show this same immaturity. What I mean by that is someone pushes a small child. What does that child do? He pushes him back. He returns the same thing that he experienced back to them. And what happens? Does that solve the problem? Does that make it better? Absolutely not. A situation that was unfortunate, perhaps unrighteous, something that is wrong, only gets worse. And what is not there? The glory of God. What's not being done? Any ministry. Now, we can expect immaturity from small children, but we're supposed to grow in the faith. We're called to live differently. We are not called to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by kingdom truth and that kingdom power and that kingdom perspective. And that is exactly what this passage is going to impart to you if not only that you understand it, but you apply it to your life and the various situations that that you and I encounter. We must behave in this way. So he says, Bless the ones persecuting you. And then he says, you bless and do not curse. Now, when he uses this term cursing, do not think that we're talking about, you know, putting some spell on someone. This is not the curse that the Bible speaks of. When it speaks of a curse, don't think in that sense. But cursing simply means to speak unkindly or in a way that's adverse to that person, or will cause others to think unkind or adversely towards that person that you're speaking about. So don't speak unkindly or negatively to that person, 
what person that one that is persecuting you causing you to suffer causing you to experience discomfort ruining your day being at odds with you maybe even your enemy he says simply do not curse them we are never given the freedom to speak a curse an unkind word to someone else about that person who is is causing us trouble so he says look again bless the ones who are persecuting you bless and do not curse verse 15. now he's going to be moving to various different situations various different experiences a person can have and now we are going to move into how we should be someone and he says here look at verse 15. he says rejoice with the ones who are rejoicing now many times something good happens to someone and for whatever reason that person their insecurity their their pride whatever it may be instead of being happy for that person that good event that good situation that that person finds themselves in that causes the other person to feel worse about themselves to to be depressed to be unhappy that good day for someone else many times ruins someone else's day and what paul is saying is that is never appropriate never appropriate for believers see he's giving us commandments here new covenant commandments that are relevant for a kingdom people and he says again rejoice with the ones rejoicing someone's having a good day they're happy about it you be happy for them and conversely when someone is weeping that they're going through difficult times that they are experiencing things that's unkind adverse being done to them and they're weeping he says you weep as well and then look at the next verse verse 16 he's talking about behaving in a way that is spiritually appropriate what does that mean behaving in a way that will bring about the spirit's presence and activity in a situation let me say that another way behaving in a way that ministry will be done so look at verse verse 16 he says literally this this way or the same now he's talking about feelings people rejoicing they have a happy feeling people weeping they have sadness and what he's saying here is in an appropriate way in that same way that someone else is feeling well let's look at it he says in the same way for one another think so you think in the same way that they're thinking how do i apply that to a situation well someone is very unhappy because something that was done to them some experience maybe it was done by a person maybe it was just a happening that took place that is causing them grief and sadness and such and what he's saying here is that you need to think in that same way or in an appropriate way understand the pain the hurt the misfortune that they are experiencing look at this from their perspective have that same vantage point and and identify empathize with them now what we're learning is this empathy is necessary to do ministry we're called to be a blessing and if you can't empathize with someone you're not going to be able to bless them you may not even see the need for that person being blessed why they need to be blessed how to bless them what they're going through so he wants us to have that same feeling that others are having that we think in this way and then he says and none of this is by chance all of this is being written down by the holy spirit using holy individuals what do i mean holy individuals 
individuals that have been set apart for the purpose of God. And they're writing these these things down because there's a relationship to them and even the order. Now, what is going to hinder me in my ability to serve God, in my ability to bless someone else, in my ability to do ministry? He tells us a a big factor that is going to, to hinder the spirit, quench the spirit, grieve the spirit. And what is that? He says, look carefully at the text, verse 16 in the middle. He says, do not be thinking. And this word means in a haughty manner, in a high manner, in a prideful way. That's how we would understand it today in our language. Do not be thinking in a proud manner. Proudness always has to do with self. Don't be bringing into the issue. You have an opportunity to bless someone, to minister to that person, to help them, to assist them, to encourage them, to teach them something, to be merciful. All those things we learned last week. And pride gets in the way. So do not be prideful. But as we're going to see, we need to see the example of Messiah. Now, in another scripture, Paul writes... For example, in Philippians chapter 2, he says, let the same mind that was in Messiah also be in you. What is that same mind? Well, in that passage of great theological significance, it talks about the kenosis. What is that? It's a word for emptying oneself. It's a word of humility. So don't be prideful don't think about yourself how is this going to impact me how what is this going to cost me what other things could i be doing other than this those are not the thoughts of ministry think about the perfect example messiah issue if you look sometime at isaiah 63 we see something we see that god looked down upon the situation of humanity And he saw that no one was wanting to help. No one was willing to do anything. No one was concerned about that eternal judgment and condemnation that was going to fall upon humanity. So what happened? God took it upon himself. Now, what did God benefit from this? What did he get out of this? Absolutely nothing. God does nothing motivated by by self. Why? God does not need anything. God is perfect. God never lacks. So nothing that God ever tells us, instructs us, commands us to do is for his betterment. He needs nothing. So what's the implication of that? What he commands me to do is going to either benefit someone else and I have an opportunity to to serve God by being a blessing to someone else What a wonderful use of time. Or what he's telling me to do is going to bring as I minister in his name for his purpose. God is going to look upon that and that he is going to move in my life. One of, and we can call it kind of a spiritual insurance policy. And that is what I do to others. God is going to measure back unto me. Now, we know that in a negative way, but that same truth should be applied to a positive situation. So when you are a blessing to others, when you meet the needs of others, God sees that. What does the scripture say in Hebrews? God is not unjust, which means God is just. And he will remember all the good things that we do in his name. And what will he do? Reward us for that. So we need to realize Do not be, do not be people who who think in a prideful way. But, keep reading in verse 16 towards the end where it says, but with the humble ones. Now, this word can mean humble, but it can also mean those who are lowly. This word can be those in society that, that the world sees 
in a lower class, in a lower situation, whatever. Those that, that many people in the world simply overlook or something worse. They see these people who are lowly, humble, not necessarily possessing a position or having much assets or influence. And what happens? They see them as individuals that are easily dominated, that you can exploit. And he says, never, ever do something like this. But for the orphan, the window or widow and the stranger, be kind. This is what, what distinguishes us as the people of God, that when we see an orphan, we minister. When we see a woman who is a widow, that we minister. We see a stranger, he told us last week, to have love for the stranger, that foreigner. And as I said at the end of our study, God is giving us opportunities because there's many refugees, many people who are being displaced from a variety of reasons, war being one of them. And we see that we need to demonstrate our faith in regard to them. So he says, don't be high-minded, prideful, but with the humble ones, go around and then look at the last part of the verse. He says, do not be, and many Bibles will say, do not be wise. But literally, it's the word for thinking. Now, some will say it's an adjective in Greek. The adjective and, and the nouns oftentimes are one and the same. Only context or usage tells you what part of speech it is, whether it's a noun or an adjective. And I would argue when we look at the end of verse 16 where it says, do not be, what it's saying here, thinkers. Don't be thinkers from your own self, meaning this. What does Proverbs chapter 3 say? Do not lean on your own understanding. Now, what he's saying here is not don't think. Of course, we're supposed to think, but not from ourselves. And what he's emphasizing is this. If we're going to do ministry, we are dependent upon revelation. So don't think logically according to, to man. Don't bring the wisdom of this world, the knowledge of this world into it. But if you're going to do what he says here and utilize this truth in a way that's pleasing to God, that's serving God by serving others, then, then do not be thinkers of yourself, but we need God's revelation. Verse 17. Not returning evil for evil. Someone's unkind to you? What's the natural response? That old man, be unkind to them. That's our old nature, that old man that, that was within us that should be nailed to the cross, dead, buried. But all too often, we go back to, to that behavior. We need to remember that we are a new man, a new woman in Messiah. So he says, do not repay evil for evil. But he says, provide. Now, this is a word for preparing and giving. So many Bibles translate it provide, which is fine. Provide good before all people. Provide that which is good for them from God's perspective God's truth, God's revelation. So it goes back to a very simple principle and that we want to influence people, not manipulate people. Many people today, they want someone else to do something because it'll benefit them. That is not spirituality. That is sinful. Manipulation that has me as the, the end objective is most displeasing to God. No, what we want to do is behave to have an influence on that person, not manipulate them to our desires, but to influence and impact them so that God's will they will experience, that they will begin to submit and live obediently to the truth of God, that they will be led by the Spirit, not manipulated by 
our own fleshly desires but influenced by the spirit of god verse 18. it says if possible if one is able some will say as much as it's dependent upon you that's more of a paraphrase but it captures the the meaning if possible from your own that means as much it depends upon yourself with all men and it's in the plural all people it says live peacefully in other words here's the the practical do not be at disagreement at war at conflict with other individuals in other words avoid conflict now that does not mean to compromise truth there are people today within the believing community and they are doing something that is disastrous something that is most displeasing to god they're compromising the truth of god for they say unity no compromising truth does not bring unity it brings the judgment of god upon those who compromise the truth and those who agree with them no we're not talking about compromising truth what we're talking about here is this as much as possible as much as it's from you under your ability to live peacefully don't seek conflict and try to diffuse conflict with other people when was the last time you prayed god you help me the next time that that something happens and my old self gets in the way i can identify with this so easily that someone does something and it's wrong it's unkind it's not righteous it is mean-spirited and what happens well we think that gives us the green light to to behave unkindly to return evil for evil to stand up for our rights we demand our own justice and what happens nothing good comes from that we're not a testimony but what happens we create greater conflict so he's simply saying to diffuse to lessen to take down the conflict and and be workers that bring about peace verse 19 and not making vengeance of yourselves beloved so do not do vengeance for yourself now this word vengeance very important word and what we're going to learn is i'm never in the position for vengeance why because i am not god the scripture is going to tell us notice what he says first of all not for yourselves of yourself having retribution vengeance beloved but he says give a place for wrath meaning this you don't take the matter into your own hands but if god so sees fit at some time in the future to judge to put forth his wrath let god do it he is appropriate for that you and i or not we get too much of ourselves involved in it so leave a place if needed be is the intent for god's wrath why for it has been written to me is vengeance now do you know that word vengeance in the greek language what it is very interesting we hear vengeance and we think one thing but the biblical word what it is here you look at it it's the word ek which means out of producing something from something so it's out of or from and the next word here is the word for for justice or righteousness so vengeance is not about me being defended me getting what's coming to me what i think's right what i think i deserve but but vengeance always has as the objective to bring righteousness out of a situation and who can do that god does so we do not use vengeance for ourselves when god moves in a way of vengeance it is for the purpose of producing righteousness 
very important way, word. He says, for I will, will recompense, says the Lord. He's going to bring about the recompense, that payment back, if it's needed and when it's needed. And his payment will bring about righteousness, not yours and not mine. So it belongs to God. And then he gives us some other instructions that are very foreign to the things of this world. He says, look at verse 20. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If thirsty, give drink to him. For in doing this, for doing this, you place fiery coals upon his head. And here again, the implication is this. You don't take matters into your own self. You're kind, you're patient, and you give to your enemy's needs. Hungry feed, thirsty give drink. Now, we don't want fiery coals to be placed upon him. We want that kindness, that love, that behavior to change him to bring him submissive to the will of God, that he begins to behave in a godly way, in a righteous way. And therefore, if he does not, then at God's timing and God's activity, there's that fiery coals. One more verse and we'll be done. He says here, do not be overcome by evil. Don't let evil dominate you and turn you into something you ought not be. So he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome, overcome with good, the evil. So when we encounter evil, what do we do? Good. What is that? God's will. And when we do that, doing good will defeat the enemy. It will bring about in the end, what God wants there to be. Very practical information. That if you focus upon these words, study these words, read them over and over, pray over them, I promise you, you begin to apply these to your life and you're going to be amazed at the transformation that takes place in you.